Hello, everyone. Welcome to the panel, this panel on the future of climate justice actions that change systems. It's sponsored by the Edinburgh Futures Institute. I'm Elizabeth Bomberg. I'm a professor of environmental politics here at the University of Edinburgh, and I research in this uh, area, but I also have the joy of teaching students and discussing with them issues linked to climate, environment, justice, and politics. And for that reason, I'm delighted to share this third and final segment of the Edinburgh Conversations on the Future of Climate Justice. Just to ground it a little bit, this is the third event. And at the first event, we heard from moral philosophers, from economists, from NGO leaders, and they were offering insights into the concept of climate justice, uh, what it means, what are its causes, and why we should uh, care. And then some of those same things were taken up at the uh, second event last week. And that was a performance by Karini Baroka, which linked climate injustice with economic disability and historical uh, injustices. And I'm delighted to say that Karina Oroka joins us again this evening. But for this uh, third event tonight, we want to build on both those earlier uh, events and we want to focus on something, something major that was touched upon but we weren't able to explore in depth. And that question is about action. We know climate justice is important. We know we should uh, care. What actions can we take? What actions should we take? What actions have already been taken? Um, and we know, and many of you listening, I'm sure that um, individual action is very important. Many individuals are keen to make changes, but we need to know, will individual action make a difference? Will it change systems? We know that collectively uh, we can make a difference. If we act together, we can bring about change. But we also know there are formidable hurdles to that change. There are structural, economic, political, psychological uh, hurdles. So this is what we want to explore uh, tonight with an amazing uh, cast. We want to explore the opportunities for climate uh, action, individual, collective opportunities at the local, national, regional, international, uh, level. That's our focus and it's no small task. And that is why I'm so delighted that we have assembled an amazing uh, panel to help us uh, do that. And what I want to do now, I want to just briefly introduce our six uh, um, panelists. I'll then ask each of them a, a, a question. We'll have a little uh, discussion. But we also want to be sure to leave time at the end for you, the audience, to ask uh, questions of the panelists, either individually or the panel as a whole. If you want to do that, if you want to post a question, you'll see uh, you'll see the link below the uh, embedded video, and you can just click on that to post your uh, uh, question. So let me introduce this uh, amazing panel. And I'm going to do that alphabetically because I don't know how else to start. And um, so I will start with someone I mentioned, that's Corinna or Oka Baroka. And uh, Oka is a poet and an artist originally from Jakarta, Indonesia. She's the editor of Modern Poetry in Translation. She served as artist in residence or at fellows at various prestigious writing um, uh, institutions or arts foundations. She has authored, she has edited, she has illustrated several uh, publications. And her latest book is Ultimatum Orangutan. And it was uh, shortlisted for a literary Borelian prize. And that prize is dedicated to highlighting disabled voices in particular. Uh, next up is Alice Hill. Alice is a policy analyst based in Washington, D.C. DC. She's got expertise on risk, climate, and resilience. She served as a special assistant to President um, Barack Obama. She has advised the National Security Council, the UN Department of Homeland Security. And Alice works on this nexus between public uh, health uh, risks, between security risks and uh, climate risks. And she's currently a fellow for energy environment at the Council of Foreign Relations in Washington, DC. So welcome to you, Alice. 
Third up, we have George Mambio, and he's known to many of you uh, listening, uh, I'm sure. He is an amazing author. He's a prize-winning journalist. He's a Guardian columnist. He's an environmental uh, uh, access par excellence. He's got an extraordinary uh, range of writings and, and uh, videos uh, which cover uh, issues as broad and varied as um, corporate power and uh, democracy, his travels in Brazil and in Indonesia, the climate crisis, rewilding. And his latest uh, book is on uh, food and uh, farming, and it's called Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. And that was just published last May. So thanks for joining us, uh, George. Next up is the incredible Vanessa uh, Nakate, who uh, must be absolutely uh, exhausted. She's also just come back from Washington DC addressing the um, IMF. She has a brief uh, stay uh, here in Edinburgh where she just attended the first minister's conference on loss and damage. Maybe she could say something uh, about that. Vanessa is a climate justice activist from Uganda. I had the great pleasure to hear her speak at the last uh, climate summit in, in Glasgow. She's the founder of the Africa-based up movement and the Green Schools projects. Uh, she campaigns tirelessly and internationally to highlight the impacts of climate change already occurring in Africa. Most recently, she is now currently serving as the UNICEF uh, in, uh, Goodwill Ambassador and just spent uh, time in the Horn of Africa and experienced firsthand the impact of climate change there. And I hope she can speak to us uh, about that. So thank you for making time for us, Vanessa. It's a real pleasure uh, to have you. Joining us from uh, Manila in the Philippines is Mitzi Jonel Tan, uh, also a climate justice activist who focuses particularly on making sure that the voices of the Global South, youth voices, but also indigenous voices uh, are heard and are amplified. She is the convener and the international spokesperson for the Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, which is the Fridays for Future um, of the Philippines. And we look forward to hearing about uh, her experiences as, as well. Uh, uh, last, but only alphabetically, Laura, is uh, Laura Young. She is a local. She's based here in uh, Scotland. She's uh, an alum of this uh, university. Laura is an environmental scientist, a climate activist, a sustainability communicator, and what we now call an ethical influencer. In fact, I just read that Laura was shortlisted for the Scottish Influencer of the Year. So congrats on that, Laura. She's worked or volunteered for, for a whole range of different climate groups, but She's especially well known, I think, for her social media presence, her platform, and her handle is Less Waste Laura, if you want to look that uh, up. And then, because that wasn't enough, um, I think she's just started a PhD in climate resilience uh, as well. So it's wonderful to have you and the other panelists here. And with this lineup, I think we can tackle most anything. So I'd like to get uh, started. And again, I'm going to ask each of the um, panelists a question based on their own experience. Other panelists are welcome to jump in if you wanted to add something uh, to that. And uh, together, I'm hoping we can gather a whole flurry of um, insights on action of all different types. I'm going to start with our youth uh, activists, and that's precisely because the voices of the young are not always heard, even though, of course, their generation and their children's generation will have to clean up our mess. And by our, I mean my, my old self uh, mess. Okay. So, um, Vanessa, I'd like to start with you if I, uh, if, if, if I could. Um, I and many others listening uh, and here on the panel, we followed your uh, amazing uh, journey and um, we're struck by how your work on youth climate activism, so intergenerational uh, justice, um, intersects with issues of racial justice, with gender equality, with the power of um, education. And I'm wondering if um, maybe again, perhaps relating this to your own uh, most recent experience in the Horn of Africa, can you tell us a bit how you came to connect these different issues, climate, 
climate justice, racial justice, the power of education, gender equality, how you came to connect these issues and how that connection has uh, shaped your um, own actions and activism. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you so much. So I will share my experience in Turkana where I visited with UNICEF and I got to meet different you know, mothers, different children, and the communities that are being impacted by the drought that is happening in the Horn of Africa right now. This is the worst drought that the Horn of Africa has seen in 40 years, and it has left a lot of devastation in these places. And well, I remember when I you know, I just started my activism. I remember reading an article that talked about how, you know, women and girls are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. And when I was in Turkana meeting some of the mothers, one thing, one of the things that I remember them constantly saying was that as the drought intensified, um, the fathers or the men in the community started to move with the animals to look for pasture and to look for water. So many of these mothers were left uh, with no you know, access uh, to food. And they believed that you know, as the men of the community moved with the animals, probably they could get chances of getting food, but for them, they had to stay at home and try to figure out how they can access food. And they also explained, you know, the issue of water access, how they have to walk really long distances to look for water for their families. And in many cases, some of them have to sleep at the water sources so that they can restart the journey back home because by the time they get to the water sources, it's already late in the night and they can't walk back home. So the, these are some of the stories that and experiences I got to hear from the mothers in this place. And also I remember reading that article explaining how many times girls are forced to drop out of school and also forced into you know, early marriages as a result of the climate impacts that are happening. So from that article and also the experience that I you know, got to see in Turkana, I really understood how women and girls are on the front lines of whatever crisis that we face. They are on the, on the front lines. And of course, you know, children as well. This is a place where many children are suffering with severe acute malnutrition, there is so much devastation. Children are being born into malnutrition. That is something that one of the mothers told me. I asked her when her child started to fall sick and she said, my child started to get sick as soon as he was born. He was born into malnutrition because there was no food. I didn't have food myself. So these are some of the experiences that you know, people are going through when it comes to um, regions that are impacted by the climate crisis. I still remember one of the mothers sharing with me that her dream is to see her child go to school one day. So she's seeing this impact of the drought, how it's affecting their access to food. She's hoping that maybe someday in the future, her child can go to school and, you know, support her uh, or lift her out of the poverty that she's experiencing. So even her hopes and dreams for an education for a child are really far away because of the impact that she's experiencing right now. So we know that climate change is pushing many children out of school. And it's also pushing many children to not even have any access to school at all. And when we talk about the issues of you know, racial justice. We know that those that are on the front lines of the climate crisis are the ones who are least responsible, Africa being responsible for less than 4% of the global emissions. But we are seeing this drought in the Horn of Africa. We are seeing cyclones affect the southern part of Africa. We are seeing countries like Pakistan being impacted by floods that are, you know, affecting millions and millions of people, leading to the loss of lives, you know, devastation of people's livelihoods, loss of homes, businesses. These are things that are happening to people that are not responsible for the climate crisis at all. And it's not just in the, you know, in the most affected areas, but also when I when I visited um, 
some of the regions in the United States. Um, I, I visited some of the black communities and one of the communities that I visited in New Orleans, I got to meet some of the, you know, the people working on organizing and mobilizing for climate justice. And I remember visiting a region that they called Cancer Alley. And I was told this is a region that is a region of mostly um, black people. And this is a region that has about 150 chemical plants. And they explained that almost every family in that area has someone who is suffering as a result of cancer because the air is polluted, the water is polluted. So it goes beyond you know, what they call the global south to actually the, the people, black communities that are living even in the United States, even the, in the United Kingdom, you, you could probably know about the case of a young girl, her name Ella, who, was, who also died and her death was related to air pollution in the residence where she was staying. So these are some of the, you know, the intersections that I've got to learn as, I, as I've done my activism, how everything is interconnected. And this shapes the way we do our activism. We get to understand that climate change goes beyond whether it goes beyond statistics, it goes beyond data points. And it's really about the people because when you bring people in the conversation of what climate justice really means, that's when the intersections start being very clear. So that you know that your fight to reduce emissions is actually a fight to make sure that a girl goes to school or your fight you know to reduce emissions is actually a fight to ensure that specific communities that are already suffering are being helped so for me understanding these intersections has really helped me look at climate change beyond uh, statistics and seeing it as something that is about people it has also helped me understand how climate justice is beyond you know us installing um, solar infrastructure, but it's really about communities and ensure that ensuring that communities are protected and people are protected and the ecosystems are protected. Gosh, okay, that is so powerful. Thank you, Vanessa, because you highlighted uh, very well both the disproportionate impact and why climate justice is not just about climate, um, but also you pointed to some um, mobilization and some action linked to education or linked to community power and community mobilization that I'm hoping maybe we can uh, build on uh, as well. So um, thank you very much. Um, so Mitzi, some of that must sound somewhat familiar uh, to you. Like, like Vanessa, you've done tons to raise the issue of climate justice issues of particularly uh, impacting the uh, youth and indigenous communities in the global south, starting in Philippines, but so beyond that. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, Mitzi, um, you, you spoke earlier about how you became concerned about some of these issues, but then you went from that, um, that concern into a kind of full-blown um, organizer and uh, mobilizer. And I'm wondering if you could say something about that journey, how you turn that concern into this amazing ability to or, um, organize and what you learned from that, that experience, what worked and what didn't. Can you share that with us? Like many people in the global South and in the Philippines, I was born into the climate crisis where the Philippines has had the highest number of extreme weather events in the past 20 years, which means it was something that I constantly saw growing up, seeing entire communities in the Philippines be consumed by floods because of super typhoons that would hit our country. Yet, despite this happening to my community, to my family, to my friends, I didn't know that it was climate change because the way that it was taught, if you had the privilege to go to school was very technical, very foreign, very alienating, talking about polar bears and melting ice caps and not about what you were already experiencing. Ever since I was growing up, climate change seemed to be a problem of the future and not something that was already happening. It wasn't until much later on and I was able to talk to an indigenous leader from our country, a Lumad indigenous leader, that he told us that they were being harassed and displaced and militarized and killed all for protecting the planet. Because the Philippines is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for environmental defenders and activists. In the past 10 years, 270 um, Filipino environmental defenders, which are indigenous peoples, but are also our small farmers and small fisher folk, have been killed, making us the most dangerous in Asia for the past 10 years, 
and the most the, the third most dangerous in the world for the past 10 years. And that was those two things kind of already tell you what the challenges are in countries like the Philippines, where we're not empowered and we're not given the tools to become climate activists. At most, they tell you that it's about individual lifestyle change and shutting down the lights and reduce reuse and recycle. And we, we're not told how it's the fossil fuel industry that's behind the destruction in our own countries, that there are people behind the deaths of, of people, of, of the Filipino people and of billions of people across the world. After that conversation I had with, with our indigenous people, I realized that I had this privilege to quote unquote choose to be an activist. At that point in my life, I was deciding whether or not it was something I'd do on the side or something that I would completely do and choose every day to do. And I realized then that I had no choice but to fight back as well, but to join the struggle of our environmental defenders. And so I actively educated myself and I really just with my organization saw that one of the main things that we have to change is how the way that we're talking about the climate crisis, we keep talking about it as if it's a problem of the future instead of something that's already happening today. Mm -hmm. Like Vanessa said, as if it was a scientific fact about carbon dioxide emissions only, but not about the people most marginalized. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing that really kept us going and pushed us into not just becoming people who were concerned and voicing out concerns, but really seeing that we need to organize and mobilize people that protest thing and going to actions is so crucial. But then after that, we need people to become organizers themselves. It's not enough to join the protest. You need to join the organizing because mm. protesting is just one part of it. If there's so many things that goes into being an activist, but it's also not that difficult. You can start anywhere and at any point. And the beautiful thing about having such a diverse movement is that there are diverse tactics also, and you can start at any point. And so I think that's something that we really need to realize that it isn't difficult to be an activist. All you need is to have a heart that is ready to listen to the people most marginalized, a heart that is ready to learn, to hold yourself and other people accountable, but also to hold each other tight because it is a difficult fight that we're in because the fight that we're in is basically fighting to build a world where there is no more oppression and no more injustice. And that, that feels like a big task. But if you remember that it's not just one person, but billions of people across the globe who is in this fight with you, then you remember that it is possible, that victory is inevitable. Wow. I really appreciate you ending on that note, Mitzi, because you raised something really important, which is uh, often forgotten by uh, us in the global north, which is that environmental activists, uh, activists in many places are literally risking their lives to take uh, to take action. Um, and uh, that is often um, overlooked and the dedication that goes behind that is, is amazing. But you also then signaled how um, activism can take different forms, how varied it is, how many different opportunities uh, we've uh, we've got, and and the illustrations of that uh, in in the Philippines are are really fascinating. And it gets back to what Vanessa was saying about again, it's about that local mobilizing uh, uh, mobilization uh, as well. So wonderful, lots we can return to again. Thank you so much, Mitzi. Um, I want to now turn to uh, Laura, um, the uh, youth activist from uh, from uh, Scotland. And I wanted to ask Laura because she's a, a past student here in Edinburgh, now a PhD a student, was very active both uh, within the university and out with the university. Laura, I wanted to ask you about the university's uh, role in uh, climate action and particular university students uh, role. At our first uh, uh, panel, we heard uh, from um, Arunaba Ghosh, who was uh, telling us then that universities could and should be places that educate, agitate and organize. I think you would fit really well on this panel as well. Um, so Laura, can you say a little bit, what have you found to be most uh, uh, effective from the perspective of a student, what remains unharnessed uh, as uh, as well? Uh, what should we expect more from in terms of the universities, if not the university students? 
Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's such a great question. And I think it's important to say that my background when I was at university was studying geography and environmental science. So I definitely got the climate education, but that doesn't mean that everybody who goes to further education gets information about the climate crisis, about sustainability, about these really important topics. And beyond that, even intersectionality, what we've been talking about tonight. And I think education is one of the big things that we need to be doing when it comes to this I think partly we just need to educate people on the issue I think we are all now familiar with the term climate change but we might not know what it means for us on that individual level or maybe what it means for us in our families in our communities in our different places of employment and I think it's really key that universities embed climate and sustainability education into every single subject. Um, when I was at the University of Edinburgh doing my master's, I did some amazing co-curricular pathway things where we learned loads about climate change and sustainability, but that was an added extra. It was an optional. And actually bringing sustainability into the core of all education pathways is something that's really key. The interesting thing about my PhD project just now is I'm doing it between two universities and one of the universities doesn't actually have a geography and environmental science school. Um, I actually sit within an engineering school. And so one of the things I'm exploring is what it looks like to sit in the School of Engineering where people maybe haven't ever thought about what it looks like to be sustainable or think about climate change in that context. But we know that engineers are one of the big parts of how we put in climate solutions moving away from lots of grey infrastructure to beautiful nature-based solutions takes engineers understanding that. When we think about any field, whether it's fashion or medicine or food, farming, whatever it is, we need everybody to have this understanding and knowledge and, and even just literacy around sustainability. And so I think the big thing we need to be pushing all institutions, schools, nurseries, colleges, universities, is to actually say how can we bring in sustainable education to the core of every single subject. I've loved thinking um, about climate change with some of my school friends who are in different industries and saying what does sustainability mean to you and how could you bring it into the sector that you work in and so I think that's a big role that universities need to be playing is actually saying let's bring this to the heart of everything but I also know universities are a great place for students to do a bit of activism to think about campaigns that they can be running you know universities are institutions they are huge they have multiple buildings they have lots of infrastructure lots of employees they also have lots of investments you know we can talk about how universities can play a bigger role beyond themselves um, and do some kind of campaigning and I remember when I was at Edinburgh for example there was lots of campaigning going around uh, coffee cups and single-use plastics and that might be a small part of the picture but actually it's a really good place to start and say actually how can we do that and then tap into the alumni. You know, you've got these great events, but actually when you think about the network that universities have, they have people in all different places and spaces from government to industry, business, the third sector. And we need to be engaging with all of those networks and saying, how can we continue that education? Even once people leave the doors, you know, leave this institution, how can we be continually pushing for that change? Mm. Wow, that, that is such a fine... Um to-do list uh, that we can uh, bring back to to our universities and also also the mo the, the the more uh, challenging provoking in terms of you said there are large they, they're large financial institutions as well and have a lot of uh, could have a lot of influence just in terms of where their investments are and things of that sort as well so um that that's that's excellent um Laura, and I think it's a nice uh, transition to what I want to ask George, because I don't think George much um, cared for his university education itself. He's made up for that um, afterwards, but um, uh, maybe you can reflect on that as well. But George, what's becoming clear so far is the the multifaceted nature of climate and climate justice. We've talked about the mm -hmm. intersection with other forms of justice. Laura's talking about the intersection uh, between uh, different um, uh, disciplines and different ways of uh, educating. 
And uh, I know you can speak to any of these things, but I thought I would ask you uh, about um, the intersection or the, or the linkages uh, between this theme of climate justice and your more, most recent book, which is on uh, foods and farming and biodiversity loss and much else um, uh, besides. So um, one, of the, one of the questions I had is um, whether you thought that the, the, the barriers to addressing unsustainable food production, right? That you speak about quite eloquently in that book. Um, are these the same barriers that are obstructing climate action? And if so, how and can we should, how can and should we surmount both of those sets of barriers? Thanks. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. And it's a great honor to be in such wonderful company. I'm, I'm really, delighted to be sharing this panel with some of my great heroes from around the world. So thank you everyone for, for being here and thank you for having me as part of this. Um, so the, the first thing to say is we, we are facing, of course, a multiple crisis. Um, we divide the world into what we call climate and oceans and soils and ecosystems and ice caps and humanity. Uh, but nature recognizes no such distinctions. We have created these boxes to make the world easier to study. And we say, we've got a climate crisis. Oh, and we've also got a biodiversity crisis. But the two things are very closely interlinked. They cannot be easily separated, not least because a very large component of that climate crisis is the loss of the living planet's ability to absorb um, carbon emissions. And indeed, a lot of our most important carbon sinks have been turned into carbon sources, either because um, they've been severely degraded or because of the feedback impacts of climate breakdown as, as, as the world gets hotter. For instance, the permafrost melts and releases some of its methane and carbon dioxide, but also because of the ways in which we have transformed ecosystems into um, sites of human activity, which um, are extractive and um, degrading of both their biodiversity value and of their ability to store carbon. And it's an uncomfortable fact that the activity which has done that the most is agriculture. Uh, you know, we, we'd really rather not face that fact. It's quite uh, almost comforting to attack the fossil fuel industry. I mean, it's not really comforting. It's it's a very brutal and difficult business. But, you know, we have a distance from the fossil fuel industry, which allows us to say they are clearly our enemy. Mm -hmm. But farming is much more integrated into our lives. And so to see this sector as, you know, what the science says very clearly, it's the greatest cause of habitat destruction, the greatest cause of wildlife loss, the greatest cause of species extinction, the greatest cause of soil degradation and loss, the greatest cause of fresh water use, uh, the greatest cause of land use, which is possibly the most important of all environmental issues, which we neglect terribly. One of the greatest causes of climate breakdown, one of the greatest causes of um, water pollution and of air pollution. That, that's, these are very uncomfortable things to face. And they have to be navigated very carefully because you know, we need to distinguish between people who are making the subsistence living from farming um, and who have absolutely no choices, um, effective choices. And this massive capitalist combine, which is destroying not just the living planet, but also our future means of feeding ourselves at the same time. Um, because the levels of, of particularly soil degradation and freshwater use are completely unsustainable, even in the course of a couple of decades. You know, it, it cannot be sustained. You know, we're going to see massive dust bowls. We're going to see um, uh, crucial sources, aquifers running out and others which um, uh, supply ongoing water, um, um, such as glaciers and snowpack melting away. Um, and so we really need to rethink a great deal of the ways in which we produce our food. A crucial part of that is moving away from the consumption of animal products, because animal products, um, by and large, are massively disproportionately destructive. 
Now, again, I'm not talking about subsistence people like the Turkana, who, who, who Vanessa has been talking about, and um, in, who, with whom I spent several months myself quite a long time ago, um, um, you know, who really have no option. That is their subsistence living. But you know, us wealthy consumers like myself in, 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 in the West, we do have options, and we should be moving away from an animal-based diet as quickly as we possibly can. And now there are some very interesting new technologies such as precision fermentation, which will soon make that a lot easier. But rather than digging deep into that, I wanted to address um, a couple of things that you said uh, at the beginning of your introduction to me, if, if you don't mind. Um, and one of the reasons why I found my university experience so dismal is that it was so narrow. There was a complete lack of academic intersectionality in that. I was there to study zoology and zoology alone. I couldn't even study biology because Oxford at the time didn't have a biology degree. There was a zoology degree and a botany degree and you have to decide whether you're on the side of plants or on the side of animals. You couldn't be both. Um, and as for fungi and bacteria and things, well, they're neither zoology nor botany. So what do you do about them? Who knows? And it, it's a nonsense. You know, I came out of university knowing less about the world than I did when I went in. And, and it, it manufactures narrowness and ignorance. I mean, in this country, you have to decide at the age of 16 whether you're going to study humanities or study sciences. And if you study humanities, that's your life course, more or less set. If you study sciences, likewise. I mean, it's a particular tragedy that um, so many 16-year-olds stop studying science altogether um, are, are at the point at which they start studying their A-levels. Because while you can more or less scrape together self-education in humanities, it's really difficult to do that in science, you know, outside of a structured educational setting. And so we're turned into sort of idiot savants. You know, we know an awful lot about very little and almost nothing about the rest of the world. And then we're flung into this world with so little experience and so little knowledge and unsurprisingly, we flounder. And I just want, in closing in this answer, to mention one of the ways, because I think it's the most important of the ways in which we flounder, which is that very, very few of us have, as part of our education, any induction into how complex systems work. Um, I'm very lucky because part of my degree incorporated ecology. And so by pure luck, it had a complex systems component. In fact, one of the people who we, we ecologists like to say invented um, systems theory, Robert May, was, was one of my lecturers. I was very fortunate in, in that respect. But the great majority of schooling and tertiary education has no contact at all with complex systems. And yet everything important on the planet is a complex system. Start with the human brain, the human body, human society, every ecosystem, every ice shelf, the oceans, the atmosphere, uh, every single thing, even our human made systems like the global financial system or the global food system become complex systems because of their own weird internal dynamics developed as a result of billions of, of random interactions. Um, they create these um, um, strangely self-regulating, almost lifelike systems it, it's it's a, a complex system is completely counterintuitive you know if you've never been taught it if you've never studied it you could simply never guess as to how it works and under what circumstances it's resilient and under what circumstances it is fragile and i i would make a very strong case i think that this is the most important topic on earth how complex systems work and if we don't understand complex systems, we will be constantly taken by surprise by the fact that they do not respond to stress in linear and gradual ways. They absorb it and absorb it and absorb it and self-regulate and then suddenly collapse. And, and that is the fate of ecosystems. That is the fate of Earth systems. That is what has happened in the past. And we can see in the geological record of mass extinctions, one system goes down, brings down the next, down the next, down the next, and the entire Earth system collapses, like at the end of the Permian period, when 90% of species were wiped out. They do not respond in the way that we're taught that systems respond. At school and at university, we're taught the world in circuit diagrams. Like, you know, this is how ecosystems work. This is how financial systems work, like a sort of plumbing diagram or an, or, or, or an electrical circuit diagram. Really, really simple. 
it, it's not just that that is uh, simplified to the point of being nonsense. It's just simply plain wrong. It's a totally different set of principles on which it works. I mean, radically an entirely different set of principles. So it's, it's like going into an English lesson and someone speaking Finnish and telling you this is English. It, it, it's, and, and, and it's, it's just plain wrong. We're being not just uneducated on this, we're being miseducated. Well, wow, that is such an excellent way to act, um, bring together what we've been teasing out so far, George, in, is, is precisely these intersections that um, these activists and others on the panel have recognized. But the reason that we in policymakers don't see these intersections from the start is in great part, I, I agree with you, is in great part precisely how uh, many of us are educated, which is not to think in these complex systems, but which is to go and take your exam so you can do your degree and get your, you know, the three or four years done. So education is definitely emerging as a theme. Vanessa talked about the power of education and, of course, our Green Schools project. Of, um, But we need to, so we need to think about education as a tool, but we also need to think about the quality of that education. And that is uh, really um, important. So thanks. Um, thanks tons for that. Um, and then speaking of these uh, interconnections uh, and different nexus, I, I thought I uh, could move now to Alice if um, if that's o o okay. So we've spoken just now about, you know, this nexus between, well, the complexity and the um, interactions between so many different factors in these complex systems. And I, I wondered if you could uh, explore with us the uh, the, the um, nexus between um, uh, climate security uh, and climate uh, justice. Um, and more specifically, it's been said, uh, I've been reading and we hear particular leaders, I won't name, say that, well, these geopolitical concerns, you know, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, well, that means that we have to push aside uh, issues such as um, climate, certainly climate justice or, or climate change, because now we have something that's really far more um, important. And I wondered with your work in Washington, D.C., do you get is that the sense that you get from your work? Do you think uh, geopolitical um, concerns do kind of crowd out or do you think they intersect with climate and climate justice uh, issues? What, what have you found? Well, uh, thank you for having me on this excellent panel. Really a thrill to hear uh, from very articulate and important voices about the need to make further progress on addressing the many challenges that the globe faces that are interconnected, are intersectional. But as I think about my own experience as a policymaker, um, the policymaker doesn't get the project as a system-wide project. They get a project based on usually, if you're in the highest levels of government, as a crisis. Um, and there's an expression that I learned very quickly when I went to Washington. I worked at the Department of Homeland Security and then in the White House under President Obama. And it's that the urgent may overcome the important. Now with climate change and some of the other threats we've talked about, but loss of biodiversity, all of them are urgent. But in the way policy gets made, uh, the most immediate gets the attention. And so we're seeing that right now with the war in Ukraine. Just a day after Putin invaded Ukraine, a letter was sent to the White House by the fossil fuel industry, and they set out immediate demands, and they saw an opportunity. They wanted to expand the export of liquefied natural, natural gas, and most of that export occurs in our Gulf region at the south, uh, southern part of the United States. Uh, we've heard Vanessa mention Cancer Alley. Uh, those areas have had a lot of oil refinery and uh, they, uh, the pollution from those activities have fallen particularly hard on disadvantaged communities that live near the refineries. So this letter goes out to the White House and they request, uh, we want more drilling, more drilling on public lands. We want you to approve more export LNG, liquefied natural gas, which is a lot of methane and 
Uh, it's well known that methane, it doesn't last as long when it accumulates in the atmosphere, but it traps more heat. So certainly in Glasgow at COP26, there was a methane pledge, understanding we need to cut our methane dramatically. Uh, but the letter called for approving proposed gas export terminals um, and making sure that new pipelines are approved for liquefied natural gas. And shortly thereafter, the Biden administration, which has done more for climate in the United States than any other prior presidential administration, but it essentially adopted many of these requests as policy, new pipelines, new export facilities, um, efforts to boost gas exports to Europe, uh, and 300 million to help build out gas infrastructure on the continent. Now, what's the concern with all this? This infrastructure is long lived. We've got a crisis. I don't, who knows how long the uh, conflict will last in Ukraine. None of us know. But this infrastructure will last for decades. And the people investing in that infrastructure will want to return on their investment. And that means that we will be rely increasing our reliance on this transition fuel versus uh, a fuel that is greener. Uh, and um, it demonstrates that when you have a crisis brewing, it can sometimes knock policy makers off course in achieving our bolder climate goals as well as other goals. And in the long term, we have a separate thread developing here. Uh, I wouldn't call it a threat. Actually, it's a concern of securitization of the world as a result of climate change. NATO, um, and I believe it's appropriate for NATO to do this, um, has taken on climate change and understanding what climate change will mean for the NATO forces going forward. But it's become clear that we will, in the developed world, never be able to build tall enough walls or have immigration policies that adequately address the challenge of the numbers of people who will be on the move as a result of either acute events, like we've seen uh, in uh, Pakistan, third of the country underwater, or the droughts that we've heard described. And in the long term, our security interests globally rest in helping people thrive where they are versus seeing people's lives upended at great cost, often, as we've heard, for gir girls uh, and women who suffer malnutrition, stunting, lack of education, and to make sure that we have the types of insurance products, the uh, stockpiling, the meteorological um, information to allow for early warning, debt relief so they're not strangled by the debt that's already been incurred and honoring the promises and probably exceeding the promises of investment towards adaptation as well as clean energy going forward. That is in the interest of global security, because with many people on the move, there's greater risk of extremism developing, of human trafficking, criminal networks taking hold, and it threatens the ability of uh, governments as well as uh, NGOs to provide the type of humanitarian assistance necessary. So bad elements exploit that moment and we get more destabilizing events that undermine our ability to keep us all safe uh, as we hopefully continue to focus on cutting our emissions and adapting to what we can no longer avoid when it comes to climate change. So security will be an overlay and then the urgency of other matters will be a challenge for us in determining the choices we make ahead. And those choices, as we all know, need to focus on keeping us safer going forward with regard to climate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And something we can maybe circle back to is, um, is also this notion of lost opportunities. So 
<laughs> how the idea of energy security, whatever you think of it as a concept, but how it might have been used to shift and accelerate certain types of um, energy uh, infrastructures and get us to think more generally about different types of security instead of, as you describe it quite rightly, being an opportunity for, in this case, fossil fuel uh, firms to um, uh, obviate um, controls that were put on some of their practices and uh, accelerate more burning of uh, fossil fuel. So again, maybe we can get on to that when we circle back. Thank you so much. Um, so um, the the last uh, the the last panelist to get my uh, individualized question, and again we can pull the themes together afterwards, is the very patiently waiting um, Olka Karina Rika. Thank you so much. And as I mentioned before, um, you had this uh, amazing performance last week. I had the pleasure of attending that uh, uh, performance, and it made quite powerful links. Uh, between issues, as I said, of climate justice, but also capitalism and colonialism, historical injustices uh, that were embedded and deep uh, seated. And the message itself was quite uh, powerful, quite provocative, intentionally uh, so, um, but also powerful um, was uh, the mode of uh, communication. It was the performance, and you can see it online, was tremendous. It was a blend of poetry and uh, imagery uh, and uh, performance, and that was the means by which you were communicating this very powerful um, message. So I wanted to broaden that out uh, to you, and I wanted to ask more generally, Olka, how, how we can do more of that, how we can use performance or art, poetry, comedy, dance, music, uh, to build awareness of climate justice and maybe even spark change. Can you get us started on that? Yeah, thank you for having us. So I feel as though myself, everyone I know, everyone in the world, our actions every day are based on a spectrum from empathy to apathy, right? With regards to different people in our lives and different people we imagine. And I feel like every political and economic conversation that we have in the world today is a battle of narratives, is a battle of storytelling, right? People who are pro-oil, people who are climate change deniers, they have a story in their heads, right? <laughs> they have images, they have slogans, and um, throughout history, everything that has been destructive to the environment has also used art and writing in different ways. And we're talking everything from corporate uh, logos, you know, um, corporate slogans, right? <laughs> There's, uh, you know, YouTubers who are far right, for instance, right? People are, are constantly using um, different forms of media to convey different messages. So art is a tool, just like any other. Writing is a tool, just like any other. How can we use these to achieve the, the, the impact that we want? Um, so for me, I'm Indonesian. I grew up in an environment of indigenous environmental activism, which meant I was very depressed a lot of the time <laughs> because there are so many losing battles. But what really clicked for me was you know, I tried to be a biology major. I tried to be, speaking, going back to education you know, on what you're talking about with George and, and with Laura. Um, uh, I tried to be an environmental policy major and it just didn't fit with my brain. And I, it got me even more depressed. And then, but as soon as I figured out that my whole life would be about storytelling and illustration and performance and video and using all of these tools that, 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 convey as best as I know how um, the changes that I want to see, right? We're all different. That's part of disability justice is acknowledging neurodiversity and everybody having different things to bring to the table, right? Um, as soon as I sort of found my lane, it was so cathartic. It was incredibly cathartic. And uh, Elizabeth, thank you for being there on Friday because um, the title of the performance was Amok, which means rage. And it was sort of connecting um, the rage that I feel and that we all, you know, feel hopefully about um, environmental crisis, climate crisis, with the rage that has been felt by millions and millions of people throughout history, because the drivers of this are colonial capitalism, right? And so um, earlier there was talk from Mitzi and Vanessa about how like we're not alone in this, right? You feel you can feel very alone when you're doing climate activism or environmental activism. You have to acknowledge there's a critical base of millions of people who feel the same way you do, who want the same things you do, right? Around the world, um, people who you've never met, and and so 
for me, what I try and do in my art is bring those people into other people's hearts. So one thing that I mentioned on Friday is um, in 2015, uh, I think there's a study that crossing national borders, so not just in Indonesia, but Singapore, Malaysia, et cetera, over 100,000 people died as a result of forest fires. Um, and this is due to, you know, air pollution, et cetera. Um, and I, I talked in, on Friday about meeting a journalist, uh, a German journalist who had covered these forest fires, but had covered um, orangutan extinction and not, quote unquote, the social justice aspect. And I felt heartbroken because this is genocide. And my book is entitled Ultimatum Orangutan or Ultimatum Orangutan. Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> but because orangutan is an Indonesian word, it's a compound word. Orang means person or peoples. Utan means forest. Every time you say orangutan, you're saying peoples of the forest. And that gets you closer to understanding our imaginary. We named them orang orangutan because we see them as people of the forest. We see them as equals to us. You know, Language is philosophy. Language is cosmology. And there are thousands and thousands of indigenous cosmologies around the world that have been threatened by colonialism um, that have knowledge systems that are incredibly powerful that do have this understanding of complex systems that have been educating communities in specific two biomes throughout centuries and have been fighting these incredibly um, destructive genocidal battles against a colonial capitalism. I'm from Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies Corporation was the first proto megacorp um, and caused, among other things, two centuries of slavery in, um, of Indonesians, which a lot of people don't know about. And a lot of, you know, all these people being enslaved are peoples who wanted their environment protected. And you need, to, so you need to understand the history of colonialism as also a history of environmental defense being completely broken down. And that is the case in North America. And that's why I like to say global majority rather than global South, global North, because as um, Vanessa rightly said, in the United States, there are communities of black and brown and indigenous peoples who are also suffering, right? Um, and there's a poem I wrote about uh, uh, the death of uh, a baby in those 2015 fires from um, suffocation from due to air pollution and how both that baby and orangutans were covered in this international news segment. Um, and, the, and how uh, the cameraman involved was very angry because they were like, we're covering the genocide of you know hundreds of thousands of people potentially and the West needed coverage of orangutans, right? And when you talk about anti-palm oil plantations, which I'm very anti <laughs> because palm oil plantations are also a huge driver of climate change. So you can be vegan or vegetarian, but you won't, can also be very much contributing to destruction by having palm oil in 50% of the groceries in Western households. I live in London in the United Kingdom and palm oil is in 50% of our groceries. We're talking shampoos, we're talking soaps, we're talking detergents, we're talking ramen. Um, and I tried to keep a palm oil free home, but as I said on Friday, you know, climate change induces various feelings in us, emotions, right? Dread, worry, and all of that is related to our narratives about the future and the past and the present and what might happen. But we have to, we cannot truly divest from colonial thinking about the environment unless we understand that climate change can also feel like comfort. Because as I said on Friday, I had to use this moisturizer that did have palm oil in it that morning and I felt great and moisturized. I wasn't worried about, you know, my um, skin looking ashy or anything like that. And that was climate change feeling like comfort. When we consume at the level we do um, in, uh, as I said, I'm in the United Kingdom now, climate change feels like comfort to us. And what we need to do is divest from these dehumanizing narratives and these dehumanizing stories and storytelling about, you know, that, that um, separate all the various linkages between people being assaulted, threatened, killed, kidnapped um, because of trying to protect their rainforest in Indonesia to that rainforest being destroyed, palm oil plantations being built on top of it, to those palm oil plantations supplying us with every, you know, all the things we need in daily life from detergent to soap to um, toothpaste, what have you, right? We don't see the assault at the very end of that, right? And a, a lot of that is under reporting by Western media. Um, I'll tell you another story 
um, there were huge student protests. I'm so grateful that Mitzi and Vanessa are here and, and Laura is all talking about student protests and activism in Indonesia um, uh, a little while back, a few years ago, before the pandemic, demanding various uh, things from, you know, environmental protection to um, better uh, laws for sexual assault uh, survivors, for instance, right? And there's these enormous protests that swept um, certainly the capital of Jakarta. And it was reported in Australian media as quote unquote, sex protests, right? Because part of these protests was for a better um, uh, a bill about uh, that protects the rights of sexual assault survivors, right? But they were also campaigning for environmental laws to be reformed. And that part got cut off completely because in the Australian imaginary, Indonesia is a place where you go and have fun on holiday and hopefully you can have, you know, your whatever kind of fun you want. Right. That's the devastating level of disconnect and apathy that is bred by media that is so focused on the global minority. Um, and speaking of farmers also, and, and it's connecting some of the threads from earlier speakers. Right. Um, one of my favorite movements uh, in terms that connects, you know, farmers, justice and um, artistic uh, uh, modes of expression was the not for sale movement in Bali. So um, Bali is experiencing an extreme water crisis because all of the paddy fields, farmers, paddy fields, as George mentioned, there's you need to have a distinction between like subsistence farmers who are, you know, in tune with the environment and massive industrial agriculture. We're talking about small scale farmers here um, whose paddy fields are being bought up by resorts. Uh, by, you know, things for tourism, by malls, et cetera, as overdevelopment encroaches on Bali, which is not, by the way, a resort island, as it is often reported as in, in the Western media, right? People live there, their entire ecosystems and biomes there. Um, and what we saw was there was this movement where in paddy fields, there was the sign not for sale. That was kind of like the Hollywood sign in Hollywood. It was th these white letters, huge white letters. So everywhere you 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 would you would drive, you would see these paddy fields with the not for sale. Um, signs. And that was an artistic movement, right? These are ways that we can kind of try and um, create chinks in the, <laughs> and fissures in the narratives and, and, and the movies that people play in their heads all the time about what security is, right? What growth actually is and what that looks like and how that will make you feel, how that will make your family feel what safety feels like, right? What is safety, you know? Like what it takes to keep your family safe. What actually does that mean? Are you thinking long-term? Are you thinking short-term, you know? Are you thinking about your, you know, gated close, close, close environment or are you thinking about in the planetary sense, thousands and thousands of indigenous cosmologies being able to um, be uh, reinvigorated and uh, actually give land back to them, you know? Um, and to actually uh, look at the world with a historical uh, awareness of environmental and climate crisis as not being new. Um, uh, like a lot of people invested in indigenous movements, I see Anthropocene as beginning not 100 years ago, but 500 years ago with the beginning of European colonization, because that was mass takeover of people's lands for slave plantations, for, you know, like um, uh, in Indonesia, um, like, uh, huge tracts of rainforest being shipped off to the Netherlands to create palaces there, you know, mines and gold and, and everything, all everything that is happening right now has its antecedents in these colonial structures and colonialism isn't over. It's not a historical thing. The wealth that the global, that, you know, the global minority takes from the global majority is on par with what happened during historical colonialism when when countries were still colonies, you know, people are still taking gold, people are still taking, um, you know, nickel and lithium, etc. And so part of the art that I do is saying, you know, you may think clean energy electrify everything, but are you thinking about the children in Indonesia who are affected by nickel mines with the quote unquote Aaron Brockovich compound, the carcinogenic compound made famous by the film Aaron Brockovich, right? that is created by these nickel mines that are supposed to create quote unquote clean energy. You know, like whose lives matter here? Whose stories matter? Um, that's a huge part of, <laughs> of what um, myself and many, many other people are trying to do. And like Vanessa said, the people who are most impacted need to be given the greatest microphone in the world. So I hope that is what happens with our stories and storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's uh, so much. There's so much there, Oka. But also making this uh, link again between 
um, uh, awareness or lack of awareness. Uh, I, I remember these Indonesian fires and how little they were reported on. Uh, George Mambio wrote something on that. I remember um, more recently what Vanessa um, has written recently the, about Africa um, and the impact on Africa. Africa is in the front. Africa is on the front line, but not on the front page or, or something. Vanessa, you've said it better, but it was something to that effect. But also, OK, how words and, and stories can help make that link, um, can help can provide provide that um, that glue to the complexity of these uh, of, of these problems, and and I think your own story telling and poetry does does that in a remarkable way. Um, I I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask the other panelists. Um, may, I might start with this question of um, in in your own work in your in in, in the in the protests or on social media or in your uh, policy work do you uh, have you come across or do you yourself use um less traditional modes of communication uh, do you use art or poetry or music or or, or dance or do you have um uh, do you have uh, do you have examples of what you might like uh, like to do in terms of so using these creative arts as a uh, as, as a form of climate action does anyone else have you don't have to but if anyone else has any thoughts or experiences um yeah so um mitzi and then uh, george yeah go ahead mitzi um in the philippines because activism is so dangerous there is a taboo and stigma around it as well um so we like to make our protests really creative so that people also see that it is something that shouldn't be scary so that parents of children will see that, oh, there's a lot of music, there's a lot of dancing, there's always a lot of um, drums and it's colorful. So this is something that we can be a part of. It's also, I think, a very important way of showing people what climate, what a climate justice world looks like. That we're not just yelling and we're not just angry, but instead the world that we're fighting for is one that is full of joy and full of music and full of color and full of brightness. It's really having people imagine and really grasp what the world we're fighting for looks like. Um, for a, a very concrete example is for our last climate strike, because our president now is the son of the dictator from 50 years ago, um, protesting has become a bit more dangerous. Uh, so we did a political fashion show. So people walk down with placards and in, in like, just like clothes that we created ourselves in sustainable ways. And so it's still like a protest because you're you're still marching, but it's framed as a fashion show. And so people saw it as something that was easier to go to. It wasn't as scary and it was easier for us to get around like the permits as well, because it wasn't a protest, it was a fashion show. Gosh. Wow. So uh so almost as a very kind of a clever cover to the more dramatic, hard-hitting message that you um, that you want to make, but might not feel comfortable making that uh, directly. And 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 I love this idea of um, also bringing folks, um, getting people involved because of the, the the color and the and the music. I think that's that's just great. Um, George, what about your own experience? <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, I have tried just about every medium, including on one occasion contemporary dance. <laughs> I actually did. Please uh, show us. Please no, 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 no. <laughs> Honestly, I, I announced my retirement from the medium the following day, decided my career had peaked. Couldn't get any better. Couldn't get any worse. Um, anyhow, um, and I think, you know, I mean, for all the reasons that Mitzi spelled out so beautifully there, but also because, you know, we just have to tap into every possibility of reaching people, every way of, of attracting their attention to the issues, of waking up those parts of people which have gone to sleep, have been lulled to sleep by the mainstream media, by just the sort of whole discourse of capitalism, which just tells us, just be a good consumer, go off and do your thing and um, don't bother anyone. And that's just fine. And it's very hard for people to break out of that and to um, recognize that actually we have 
a duty to be active citizens, a duty to ourselves, a duty to each other, a duty to those who have not yet been born. And sometimes you just have to use very creative and strange and left field ways of, of waking people up and, and attracting their attention. Um, in the UK right now, we've got this um, massive controversy over the two uh, Just Stop Oil activists who threw tomato soup over the glass screen protecting uh, one of the most famous paintings in the world, um, Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers painting in, in the National Gallery. And, and, and I think it was a brilliant action myself. Um, you know, I realize I'm in a minority in this country, but it, it was viewed millions, tens of millions of times. Um, it, it attracted an enormous amount of attention and a lot of people were condemning it. I mean, it didn't do any harm. It was, it, it really was totally harmless. People just, you know, the museum staff just wiped the soup off the glass with the cloth. Um, but it was considered sacrilegious. And of course it then raises the question, well, why, why is the depiction of life so precious? Whereas life itself, seems to be much less precious to us. And I think it really opened people's minds to that discussion in a fascinating way. Mm, yeah. And what I don't know how many of you uh, listening or on that panel followed that, but what was striking and it, 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 it occurred to me then that what matters with activism is the act itself, but even more important, what happens afterwards? Because you would expect that outrage, but what happened is that one of the activists herself was quite eloquent uh, uh, explaining why, why they did that and that this was the only opportunity that they felt they had to uh, raise these, uh, these profound debates. So it's, a, it's another really interesting question about um, uh, activism, both its short-term impact and its uh, longer-term impact. Um, yeah, George, I'm really disappointed. Um, not not only are you not dancing, but you failed to mention your um, wonderful uh, um, musical uh, endeavor with um, Scottish uh, folk singer um, Ewan McClellan, which is it's on loneliness, but it affects much else uh, besides. And George, um, George, uh, you were involved, but you said um, you 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 do not sing on that because your singing is banned under international law. So maybe it, it you're down. Article one of the UN Torture Convention. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it is another way. It it really is powerful because it shows you know the power of music to get us um, to to bring us together uh, to take action to see what we can do um, see what we can do collectively. So you know these are great great examples. Anyone else want to um, pitch up there or indeed panelists, is there anything that the other panelists uh, said that uh, you would like to um, respond to or add to before we move to the uh, Q&A? I'm happy to jump in, I guess, sure. just with something that we've maybe not spoke about, which is social media. I feel that's like a huge part of the work that I do and probably lots of other people. And I just think, um, you know, one of the biggest things we can do is be storytellers. Um, and in my work, that can sometimes be quite diverse. The other day I was sitting uh, with a group of about 15, 85 year old men at a Rotary Club talking about climate justice. And then later on, I spent about 45 minutes scrolling through TikTok, looking at, you know, young climate activists talking on there. And I think the importance of, you know, seeing how we can tell stories on different platforms is really important. But also knowing that, you know, we need to be getting into these spaces to, to have these conversations, to be engaging on all different platforms. And I think social media is a huge part of that. You know, I'm even just looking at who we've got on the call, you know, from all over the world, so many different voices. And I know pretty much everyone on this call I discovered through social media, not because I live near them or have seen them at a real person event. And I think, you know, the power of online worlds um, can't be dismissed. And I think it's a huge part of the work that we do. Um, but it's also a massive challenge. Uh, you know, one of the biggest things, George, you mentioned the tomato soup gate. And, you know, one of the biggest uh, conspiracies that actually came off of that was that these two activists were funded by the fossil fuel industry to make climate activism look bad. But that was a genuine thing that happened. And, you know, social media can spiral out of the way. And so I also think, you know, it's a big part of our job, you know, to be picking up after events like the 
soup gate or whatever it might be to really cut through with clear messaging and, and good information and, and be those voices. And I think, you know, that's a really important factor to just kind of, I guess, keep in mind. Um, and we're probably all used to having to now use social media a bit more, but, but it's a, a massive asset, but it's also a huge challenge in the work that we do. Mm, yes. Yeah. Maybe especially for an older person. I'm not speaking, I'm only speaking for myself there, but yeah, absolutely. Great point. Um, any um, Anything else from the panelists responding to what uh, panelists say before we, um, yeah, please, Vanessa. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. It was something that was said about a small part of the picture. I believe it was something said by Laura. It got me writing uh, quite a lot of stuff that I, I would love to share. And it's, you know, basically a small part, I believe a small part of the picture often leads us to the bigger picture if our hearts are open to it. And I think that our hearts are, you know, the health of our hearts eventually leads to the health of our communities because everything that we do flows from our hearts and it's very important that we guard our hearts with truth with love with hope and with faith and grace because this determines the course of our lives the course of our communities and our posterity and it's out of the abundance of our hearts that we speak and we live and we thrive. And in thriving as communities, we learn to live in harmony with each other, with no divisions, rather to be a one mind, united in thought and united in purpose. Mm. Yeah, I just really wanted wow. to share something from a small part of the picture being important because eventually it leads us to the bigger wow. picture. Wow, that's so inspiring. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I did promise the audience that we would move to um, question uh, and uh, answer, and we've got an amazing um, list here. Um, so bear with me because uh, I, I'm scrolling through these um, and I want to make sure that I'm getting a, a good range as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. One of the questions we've got here um, is really interesting. It touches on the the temporal, the the, the time, the time element. So um, the the questioner is asking, how can we ensure that climate justice in an ever changing uh, world is uh, carried out and not being squeezed? But how fast can we respond to a dynamic uh, situation? when um, we need to ask fast, but, but change, might, cha change might take a while, it might be incremental, but we need to act quickly. This is always, this is a really good uh, question. We have to ask fast, but not all change happens that way. How do we, how do we square that? How do we, um, how do we balance that temporal need, the urgency, but also the, the momentous change that needs to come? Who would like to give that um, a, a go? Um, Oka, I saw your hand first. Yeah, um, I think, again, going back to this question of like our imaginaries in our heads, right? It's also an imaginary of like what movements are, ex exist and not feeling, not only about not feeling alone as a, an individual uh, engaged in climate justice action, but not feeling alone as movements, right? <laughs> um, because I think that's really key because I think um, within movement work, just, just from my own small experience, you know, it's, there can be a sense of, yes, of, of you know, anxiety and dread, or are we, are we moving fast enough? Are we doing enough? But also you are not alone. And I think that is where networking between climate movements is really, really, really important because you can only do what you can, right? None of us are superhuman. We can only do what we can in a given day in our given lifetimes, but other people are also doing this work wherever they are. And I think, um, I think sometimes that anxiety about speed, especially if we look at the speed with which fossil fuel, you know, proponents work and the, the PR machineries they have and, you know, everything that they have, you can become somewhat paralyzed and just look and just looking at, oh my gosh, the other side is moving so quickly, all of this. 
but I, I found that like really focusing on what we're doing and the emotions behind what we're pouring into this, you know, and the and the successes of like being in something together, I think that is so important and drowning out the sense of um of needing to work in the same way as uh enemies, <laughs> you know, as villains, um, as as you know, proponents of fossil fuel um industries or you know, industrial large-scale agriculture or climate change deniers, etc. Um uh, we work in our own, according to our own chronotypes, and that's not always a bad thing in our own conceptions of time. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah, interesting. Mitzi, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I just wanted to add how it's so cool. So that, as Elka said, we collaborate within movements, but not just climate movements, but also other movements. Mm. I've seen that a lot of times we think that it's just the climate movement that has to solve the climate crisis, but because Climate, the climate crisis amplifies and intensifies all social injustices, but it's the climate movement's duty to amplify and intensify all social justice movements. It mm. is our role as the broad movement to go to the farmers um, who are fighting for genuine land reform, to go to the indigenous peoples who are um, fighting for land back, to go to the workers' movements who are fighting for um, workers' rights to see how we can amplify their campaigns because in the end, it's all the same system that's causing the climate crisis. It's, mm. it's, we have to come together and see that, you know, fighting for the liberation of countries that are colonized and neocolonized is part of the climate justice fight. Um, in the Philippines, as George was mentioning earlier, it's, it's really important to talk about land and soil. And that's something that we're heavily focusing on in the Philippines as well because Philippine farming, I guess, similar to Oka is what she said earlier, where in, imagine medieval Europe where people plant by hand and it's just, it's, yeah. Um, so one struggle that we're really um, supporting here in the Philippines and really amplifying is the struggle of our farmers to have their land. Mm. Yeah, this is a really interesting question that's come up uh, uh, several times, Mitzi. I mean, and of course, a theme of tonight is, is this, um, complex and uh, intersecting nature of climate justice with, uh, without a doubt. So um, on one hand, that means, just as Mincy, you were saying that, so we need to treat these together. On the other hand, and we need to be honest about that, um, treating them together is a much, much more difficult in, endeavor. Uh, and so you need, there is, there is a um, balance there. It's easier to mobilize for this more narrow change, even though, um, so the question is, if it's narrow change, is that still worth um, mobilizing around or should we put that aside and go for the much more um, ambitious intersectional um, change? I, uh, <laughs> I know there's an answer there. George, fit right in. Um, go ahead. Thank George. you. So, um, I think that mainstream campaign organizations, the big NGOs, have got a profoundly mistaken theory of change. And the theory goes something like this. Um, uh, we don't have time and people won't accept system change. So we have to um, try to make change through small increments that the current system will accept without um, changing too much that, that will uh, upset people and frighten the markets and bring down politicians on our heads. And those little increments of change will eventually add up to the major change that we want to see. There is no evidence in human history that that has ever worked. And what they see as a realistic way of making change, which is small changes, is profoundly unrealistic. It just does not add up. There's no mechanism by which it can happen that way. And all the major changes that have ever taken place in human history have taken place as a result of people pursuing systemic change, mm -hmm. seeking to change the whole system. Now, I've been working on these issues for 37 years. And throughout those 37 years, I've been told there's no time for systemic change. You know, for 37 years, there's been no time for systemic change. It's clear to me now there's been no time for anything other than systemic change. And the positive aspect to this story is that society also being a complex system also has tipping points and it absorbs stress and absorbs stress and then it collapses into a different equilibrium state. And sometimes that can be a very positive equilibrium state that change can happen 
very quickly indeed. And in fact, there's some well-developed science around this supported by both observational and experimental studies showing that the tipping point is about 25% penetration of a new idea or a new perspective. And when roughly 25% of the population have accepted that new idea, everybody else just about swings round behind it um, because they sense that the social wind has changed and they don't want to be left behind. Um, there was a um, study uh, published looking at Fridays for Future in 2019 and showing it came within a whisker of that 25%. Mm. The momentum was building. It was really very close to establishing massive change across Europe in terms of climate policy. Then COVID-19 comes along. We all had to go back home. We couldn't mobilise in the streets anymore. And we're back to square one, but we came very, very close. And that is the only model which is going to change things. So this whole idea of we don't have time, there's um, the time scales are all wrong. We have to proceed slowly and cautiously is just not borne out either by theory or by history. It's a nonsense. And it, it is the way in which people stop change out of their own cowardice and timidity. Oh. Good, and that was actually one of our um, questions. So you anticipated that, thank you. Um, another question with a lot of uh, likes um, is one that we've touched on, but let's return to it. Um, it's put in the context of a uh, fracking boat in, in the UK. Um, and the questioner is asking how to campaign for justice when you're working in a hostile system. Um, that could be in hostile governments, or how do we create environmental movements which can endure and sustain those hostile uh, uh, conditions wherever you might find them? Um, Oka, I'll start with you. Yeah, just quickly, I want to say that in a hyper surveilled world in which, you know, everything from social media to our email servers to the phones we use, the devices we use, our cameras, our microphones, etc., um, are being put into giant data banks and, uh, you know, um, are being surveilled by government and non-government entities. Um, I know of organizations whose whole job is to educate um, indigenous movements or um, anti-mining movements or anti-plantation movements in terms of um, privacy, data privacy and anti-surveillance, right? That is a really key part of it that I, I think we need to say, which is that a lot of the movements working extremely hard right now on the underground are not going to be on social media, are not going to be anywhere that can be surveilled. Social media is very, very, very important, I think. I, I agree 100% with what Laura said. But we also need to understand that a lot of people work in extremely hostile environments. In Indonesia, it's definitely a hostile environment. A, a government worker was poisoned because he was anti-mine. A government worker, you know, like <laughs> fairly recently. Um, this is life-threatening stuff. And it is, um, there are, there's tactical support being offered by people around the world to people who operate in this way. There are those networks. And I just wanted to say that. Hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I've got um, another question with lots of um, likes. Um, and it's about, it, it links, I think, to what um, George was saying about shifting opinion. It says um, many countries still need a substantial shift in national level politics governments before we're going to be on the right track. So um, how essential in that is a shift in general public opinion to achieving that um, in, in practice? To what extent do you need to bring the general public along? Can you be leaders or do you need to bring them along? Uh, anyone want to say anything about that, either in the context of their own experience? Alice, I'm looking at you as someone who works in the US, <laughs> knows something about US public opinion, but um, is there sure. anything? Um, yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's a challenge. I uh, You can't get too far out in front of public opinion or if in a democracy, uh, you could have uh, the power be voted out of office. And we saw that we've seen major swings within the United States on climate policy. We have President Obama appearing in Paris, appearing in Copenhagen, and certainly in his second term uh, of his two term presidency, investing deeply personally and with his reputation on making progress on climate. President Trump gets elected, pulls us out of uh, the Paris Agreement, 
um, really reverses major policies that have been put in, in place. They hadn't been fully completed that would cut emissions. And then we have President Biden elected, but in our Senate, it's split down the middle. We have our House of Representatives, and uh, which is Democratic, and we have the uh, Senate split 50-50, but the vice president breaks the tie. Uh, and through some procedural, um, uh, a procedural course that's not available for all legislation, President Biden was able to pass our Inflation Reduction Act, which gives over about $370 billion to fighting uh, climate change and directly in cutting emissions. But we have an election coming up. Our House of Representatives uh, is entirely up for grabs. And the polling is showing that the Republicans may take over uh, the House. And the Republicans who anticipate being in power have said they would like to spend time on investigating uh, certain climate policies, certain choices that the Biden administration, including our Environmental Protection Agency, which is the agency most closely associated uh, with some of our really big climate policies. Um, and then if the Senate uh, also goes Republican, it'll be a different direction. So um, it's difficult if you don't have the general public and our polling shows in the United States, although most Americans uh, view climate change as a concern, what to do about it is really split um, down party lines and how what the urgency is, is split along party lines. So it's difficult to move in a democracy if you don't have the voter support because there's always the threat that you won't have a job. Uh, if the voters don't like what you choose to prioritize. Yeah. And if we had three more hours, we could also link that to what Laura and others were saying about the role of the media and the role of social media um, and the role of different um, interests. But instead, I'm going to uh, incorporate one of the questions we had from the audience into my um, final question uh, for you. Um, but I want to say first, this has been so amazing. It's reminded me what I so love about teaching, which is hearing the different views and the ideas and the insights and the inspirations from, um, uh, from you. One of the things I'd like to do when teaching these really serious topics of you know, climate justice and the devastation is I try to make sure that at the end, we are uh, closing um, with some sense of, um, if not efficacy, uh, if not hope, then determination. Um, and when I say hope, by the way, I don't mean a kind of Pollyanna um, sort of hope, well, everything will be all right. I mean, hope and courage uh, to, to act, okay, to um, hope enough that um, there is action we can take. So I'd like to close by um, asking each of you to do one of, of uh, two things, if you want, if you want to just sit back, you can. But one is, can you give us either one action that we could do individually, collectively, um, internationally, locally, um, or give me one, um, give me one example of what gives you um, hope and what makes you determined to act. So either an act itself or an example of where you get your hope and determination to act. Um, and I'm just going to, um, I'm going to just go by who I um, uh, see. Um, and that's you on my top, um, Mitzi, either one act or um, one inspiration, I guess. Actives to join the movement if we haven't yet, because that is also what inspires me and gives me hope. I feel like We've said earlier so many times already, it feels like there's so many things that need to be taken on. Border justice, um, liberation of colonized countries and neocolonized countries, ensuring that countries, especially like the US, are actually paying reparations and doing everything that they can to um, solve the problem that they cause. And it feels like it's a big thing, but it is possible because mm -hmm. there are so many of us in it. And that means mm -hmm. joining the movement and changing the system, as George is also yeah. mentioned. That's a uh, that's an excellent point and linking so nicely to what Vanessa said about you know small actions in a big uh, um, picture. Vanessa, do you want to add something to that or or something different? 
Yeah, maybe something different. Um, I just want to quickly um, just comment on something that was about, you know, being in a, working in a hostile kind of system. Many times when you're working in a hostile kind of system, you can start to feel like you yourself, you're hostile as well, or like you're part of the problem. And it can cause a lot of frustration or anxiety. And I just want to say that it's possible to be in the world, but not to be a part of the world. So it's possible to work within um, <laughs> a hostile system, but not be a part of that hostile system and organize and mobilize for a better system for everyone. And when it comes to action, I think that many times we are asked what individuals can do, but um, I'll personally say what leaders can do, an action that leaders can do. Um, and that is as we head to COP27, leaders should and must create a loss and damage finance facility for the communities that are on the front lines of the climate crisis. We know that finance for mitigation and adaptation is essential, but we have gone beyond adaptation right now. We can't adapt to starvation and we cannot wait any longer. We need to get help to the people that are suffering right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for COP27, but climate justice and loss and damage, the idea of compensation that those causing those countries causing that uh, harm uh, are obligated to provide fundings for those uh, experiencing that harm. That is supposed to be a big um, issue. And my fingers are, are, are crossed, Vanessa, that, that leaders listen, um, uh, listen to you. Um, I'm just going backwards now. Um, Oka, Laura, Alice, and George is an order I have. Um, and, and we have run out of time, but even just quick quickies would be great. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you to everyone on this panel and to Elizabeth. I want to say it's been great. Um, I uh, Another to hot tip for leaders is to eliminate debt. <laughs> uh, that is that that the um, so-called global south owes to the global north. This is just continuing colonialism. What more do you want from us, honestly? <laughs> like, how do you expect us? How do you expect us, honestly, to um, meet the threats of climate change and massive environmental change while you are still basically holding a gun to our heads and saying we have to pay you? I'm sorry, this is criminal behavior. Please stop. Thank you. Great. Laura, Alice, and George. Laura. There may be something people can do. I think we're going to make waves with climate when we all start talking about it and when it becomes more normal and when we see how it fits into our everyday life. So I just want to challenge everyone listening tomorrow, whether it's when you're logging into work, when you're at the checkout in the supermarket, when you're waiting on the bus, speak to someone and speak to someone about this event. Tell them you were here. Tell them something you found interesting. Just speak about it. You never know where that conversation might go. And the more we make speaking about climate change normal, the more action we're going to have and the more people are going to get on board. So tomorrow, talk to someone. I'm going to chat to the builders who you, you might hear next door about, about climate change and, and we'll see what happens. Excellent idea. Alice. Yes. Well, I come to this at a different stage in my career and I'm often asked, how do you cope with how distressing climate change is. Uh, and in truth, I find tremendous joy in this work. And so for those who are watching and are very scared and wondering how they can get involved, I wake up every day finding meaning and purpose because I am working on one of the greatest challenges in human history. No one knows, has the answers yet. It requires innovation, courage, drive, and creativity to find these solutions. And that will, as you embrace this challenge, I believe can give you the purpose and the meaning to make it not so scary and make you not an observer, but really a part of the solution. I know how that's been true for me. And I always want to share that it can be joyful, which sounds strange, but it's very true. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Alice, um, and then over to George, only because you're in my last uh, square. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't have to look very far to see what gives me hope, because I can see them right now. Oh, 
I'm sorry, that it's just, that's lovely. And I couldn't echo that more strongly. I'm not just saying this has just been so inspirational. And, and the, the folks who answered that question, you now have um, uh, actions on the individual and the collective leader. We have actions for uh, level, sorry, we have actions for leaders. And we also have some truly inspiring uh, grounds for hope. And I think that is a wonderful place to uh, stop. So go out there and take on those actions, keep the hope and uh, a huge, huge thanks to the Edinburgh Futures Institute and to the audience and, uh, and you wonderful panelists. Thank you. <laughs>